Okay. So in a way, if you think about uh, how quantum information uh, or how a part of quantum information theory has evolved uh, recently, many protocols have been studied from uh, what I call a point-to-point -point, uh, uh, scenario where there are mostly two parties. So either because one party prepares some states that are measured by the other party. So this, for instance, BB84, no? so there is Alice who prepares four different states and Bob who performs two different measurements and collects the measurement result and they construct a secret key out of the statistics generated in this process. Or, uh, I mean, you could just consider the entanglement variant of this protocol, but there are, I mean, uh, the problem of two parties sharing a correlated state is also very uh, well studied in quantum information theory. Okay, so there's a source that is uh, somewhere and prepares two particles, and these particles are sent to Alice and Bob, who perform uh, different measurements on the two particles getting results. And, the collected statistics given by this probability of seeing result A and B when making measurement X and Y. But uh, I mean, now uh, quantum technologies are evolving and there are uh, new experiments in which people can prepare different copies of different, one can have experiments with different sources of entangled states and these uh, particles are sent to different uh, uh, nodes in which you can perform measurements. And in these nodes, you can, even perform entangling measurements. Okay, so we, we are having better sources, uh, single photon or entangled sources of higher quality. Then we can have more than one source. Okay, so here you see the, all these are, so you can see them as entangled pairs. Then the nodes can collect the particles and make entangled measurements. I'm not saying sometimes you can even consider protocols with quantum memories. Now they are becoming within reach. And even you may consider protocols in which the nodes can have some uh, small uh, logic. Okay, so well, in the future, in the quantum internet, we'll have large networks with quantum computers at each node and, and, uh, and very sophisticated uh, uh, capabilities. But now, maybe I'm considering that the, no the nodes can uh, perform a, a small uh, logical quantum logic. In the, okay, so for that. This is a way in which you make uh, an entangled measurement. Okay, so you see the particles, you perform a, a given entangled unitary operation and you measure the particles. So what uh, we we'll, would we'll like to understand is what you can do when you can, when, when you can, but also we want to understand it from uh, uh, say an asymptotic limit in which you have uh, um, access to a large network. Okay, and basically the idea we want to, also exploit are these constraints uh, given by the network, as you will see in my talk later. And we plan, I mean, this is a very general problem. You can uh, study this question from many different perspectives. In what I'm going to tell you about, we are, we, and what mostly what we do in my group, we do it from a device dependent perspective. Okay, so here again, there is a network and there is a realization of this network with these entangled states and you make some measurements and you collect some outputs. And this generates a given statistics that we call correlation. So you have the probability of serving output A1, A2, A3, A4, up to AN, when you use input X1, X2, X3, X, X4, XN, okay? And this is the object we are going to deal with, okay? So again, there are different variants of this problem. There's another one in which you assume that you know the Hilbert space of these particles and, and okay. Is everything okay with the slide? Hello? Yes, yes. Okay. What, was there an interruption or everything was okay? I think just fine. There's no interruption. Okay, okay, because I saw a weird message okay, appearing. Okay. And uh, so in this device scenario, you have the Every node is just, or device, is just seen as a black box, in, in fact, a quantum black box that collects a classical input and produces a classical output. Okay, and then when we say that we will impose the constraints enforced by the network topology, what we mean is that, for instance, if you look at this uh, picture here, what, what we see because of the network geometry is that uh, one and two share two copies of the state row one, two here, okay? Then one and three share another state row one three. Okay, right row, but it, it's assumed to be a different state. Okay. Then two, four have one state, three, four have another state. You see all these tensor products are just given by the network geometry. 
and then they implement measurements M1, M2, M3, M4 of cost and some product because these are local measurements. Okay, and the, I'm going to apply systematically these constraints, which basically says where you put a tensor product in the writing of the quantum objects that may give rise to the observed probabilities. And I think this is a nice uh, scenario because you can, in, as it happens for the device and scenario, you can get results on quantum foundations, but at the same time, you can also get results that are relevant for quantum information applications. Okay, so in this scenario, there are, I mean, if, if we understand we want to address questions here in quantum foundations and in quantum information science. So basically, this is reflected by the two main objectives that we have here. So the, one of the objectives is we want to characterize the correlation you can obtain in general networks. What are the quantum correlations you can get? We want to characterize these objects. And in particular, we want to characterize those quantum correlations that do not have a classical analog, because then when we have correlations that do not have a classical, do not have a classical analog, we may get an improvement over classical information theory. Okay, if your correlations can be explained with a classical model, it's clear that they cannot give any advantage with respect to classical information theory. And once we have identified these objects, we want to understand how these non-classical correlations could be exploited to construct quantum information protocols and here things connect more with quantum information uh, science. So let me start by the, by the first question. Okay, so we want to understand how to characterize quantum correlations in, in these networks. And uh, let me just start by the perhaps the, the simple instance of a quantum network, which is the standard Alice and Bob. Okay, so you have the source and the source prepares two particles and these two particles are measured. And what we know here is that uh, uh, we have the set of uh, classical uh, correlations, which is the one in which uh, you describe everything through classic by classical means. So there is a source that prepares some classical instructions, lambda, with from, perhaps with some given priority, p lambda, and then the output is uh, produced given the input and the and the receive instructions. Okay, in a classical way with a stochastic process, and the same on Bob. And again, I write this because this is enforced by the properties of the network. And this is what we call the set of classical correlations, which is the same as the set of EPR, local hidden variable correlations. I mean, uh, you can there are different names for the same set of correlations. And what we know today is that this set is convex. This simplifies the, the theoretical analysis and characterization, and it can be characterized by linear programming. So this is well understood, and uh, it's easy. Of course, it's not easy because at some point, uh, when you increase the number of inputs and outputs, the set has main uh, rich structure. It belongs to a, a very um, a high, uh, large dimensional space. But uh, if you are able to list the extreme points that define this convex set, okay, then you can solve uh, the problem of whether uh, something can be written in this form through linear programming. But we know that this is not everything, as we know by Bell's theorem. And we know that there is a larger set, which is the set of quantum correlation. The set of quantum correlation is the one that you can write as uh, local measurements on an entire state. Okay, so again, because of the network topology, you, the explanation that quantum physics gives to this experiment is that the state row A B has been prepared, and measurements N A given X have been implemented here, and N B given Y are implemented here. Okay, so X tells you which measurement to implement, and A the result of this measurement, and these are in general uh, POVM operators. And in this case, the characterization of these objects is a bit harder, but uh, there are some tools. So for example, there's uh, something called the navas quest thin hierarchy that you can use to uh, get some insights on, on this set. Okay, and the things are simpler uh, than in other situations because these two sets are convex, okay? And once you have convex sets, you may hope to, to use uh, tools from convex optimization theory as semi-definite programming, SDP, or linear programming. Okay, so what we know is that uh, that the set of quantum correlation is larger, and this is because we have uh, uh, Bell violations. Okay, and and this is because we know that if you make some measurements on entangled state, you can have correlation that do not have a classical explanation. Okay, so pictorially, the way we used to represent these things is like you have a set of classical correlations, which is the black one. You see, it's convex, and then we have a set of quantum correlations, which is the red one again, convex. And then we have a region of, in the set of quantum correlations that uh, does not have a class, it's not classical because it's not within the black set. Okay, if this is, you can see the zoom here. So these are quantum correlations with no classical analog. And this is in fact a Bell inequality. 
and this violates the Bell inequality, and this is the maximal quantum violation of the Bell inequality. I'm representing this for the standard case of the Clausen Horn Shimoni hole that you may know, but just I hope you understand that generically this is always this is a very standard situation. Okay, you have a set of classical correlations, the faces of this set of classical correlations are better inequalities, and regions beyond these hyperplanes are uh, within the quantum set, are points uh, violating uh, quantum correlations violating better inequality. Okay, so what is the simplest uh, network that goes beyond the standard Alice and Bob network? Okay, so one of the simplest networks you can think of is the one you get with entanglement swapping. Okay, so you have now not one source, but two sources, row AB1 and row B2C. And these two sources, uh, prepare, sorry, the states row AB1 and row B2C. And these two states are sent to three observers now, Alice, Bob, and Charlie. And they implement different measurements and get different outputs. And here, also an important difference with respect to the previous case is that Bob gets two particles and performs this and may perform entangling measurements on these two particles, okay? So now the way we represent this in the quantum case is pretty clear now. So we look at the picture and we can say that we have to write this as the trace of a measurement by Alice, measurement by Bob, a measurement by Charlie, acting on the state row AB1, tensor product, the state row B2C. Okay, so this is a set of quantum correlations in this scenario. Now, uh, if you think about how to do this uh, classically, in the past, sometimes this set was, uh, the set of classical correlation was defined as a la EPR, okay? So there is uh, some hidden variables, lambda, and depending on these hidden variables, you give the output on Alice, Bob, and Charlie, okay? As this is the standard uh, classical model EPR uh, situation. But as they argue in this paper, and I think it's, it, it makes sense, so if you want to really make a fair comparison, you have to consider the classical model in the same network, okay? And in the same network, you see there are two independent preparations and this is what you do quantumly. So I think you should not consider that these two sources prepare the same state because it doesn't make much sense. So they should really prepare two independent states, okay? And then if you take this into account, instead of uh, the, the set of classical correlations, it's modified into the one I, I write here, okay? So you have lambda for the first source, mu for the second source, two independent preparations, and then outputs by Alice are defined by lambda, outputs by Charlie are defined by mu, but outputs by Bob are defined by lambda and mu. And you can see that this is a subset of these correlations here, okay? Because if you call mu and, and, and lambda, you call it as lambda prime, let's say, this is an instance of this object here in which you have this, temps, uh, this product uh, decomposition, okay? Which is a particular instance. So clearly this set is a subset of this set. Okay, but these sets, I think, I think operationally is the one that makes sense when you look at the network, okay? Because it's the one that is naturally associated to the network topology. Okay, so we want to characterize this set and this set. So we want to characterize the set of quantum correlations in this, say this network or other networks, and we want to, set, to characterize the set of classical correlations in networks and where we impose these uh, constraints. So, what we also know uh, today is that a, a very uh, natural language to do so is the language of causal networks. Okay, so now, since up to now I've been talking about uh, networks and correlations, so now I'm going to make a small parenthesis on that, and you are going to see, I'm going to introduce a concept, and you will see that this concept is very um, practical to describe uh, correlations in networks. Okay, and this is the concept of causal networks. So, what is causal networks? This is something that uh, is uh, this is studied in, in many disciplines and in statistics in particular, so uh, in, the, in the field of statistical in, inference. So to, for you to understand, it's like you make an experiment and you monitor different variables, you observe some variables, and then you see that these variables are correlated and you want to understand what are the causes that could explain these observed correlations among variables. Because as you know, um, uh, Correlations uh, to understand there are different ways of explaining uh, different causal ways of explaining some given correlations. Okay, so typical example is like you uh, make a study in which you see um, among population, you try to identify people who smoke and then people who have lung cancer. Okay, and you will see that these two variables are correlated. So then you conclude that smoking causes cancer, but from uh, say uh, 
as such, I mean, you could also conclude, this is a, in principle, a valid possibility, well, it seems unlikely, but you could conclude that if you have cancer, you smoke, okay? Or uh, this is maybe an explanation that some uh, tobacco companies may like. So there is a variable that you didn't observe in your study, which is, uh, I don't know, like whether people get nervous or not, which is this hidden or late, what they call latent variable, kind so of a variable that is relevant to your problem, but you didn't observe because you forgot or because you couldn't. And this is the, the, the variable in which you assume that people sometimes are nervous. And then if people are nervous, they tend to smoke and they tend to have cancer. Okay, and this explains the correlation, but there is no direct causation from smoking and having cancer. Okay, so this is the language of causal networks. So you see, you have some observed variables that I'm going to represent with these circles. And then you try to put arrows and potentially also some hidden uh, uh, variables in the language to explain the correlations uh, that you see in the experiment. And this is the language, so it's called a, a DAG, directed acyclic graph, because, I mean, you, you shouldn't have loops because you have loops, you have retrocausation, you have uh, causal inconsistencies. So these are just uh, acyclic graphs and directed because you put arrows, okay? So this, you put just simply arrows to tell you the directions of causation. Okay, this is what I just said, okay? You have these directed acyclic graphs that explain causations in the set of uh, correlations, okay? And then this is a very natural language for networks and indeed uh, for the for the Bell scenario, okay? And, and uh, I mean, I, if you don't know about this paper by Tobias Fritz, I think it's a very nice paper where he really introduces these connections in, 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 in the set of causal networks. There were also previous papers by uh, uh, Speckens and, and, uh, and collaborator. I don't remember now the name, sorry. So what is then the Bell, the Bell, Bell theorem? This is what I would, or the Alice Bob scenario. So there is again a state of two particles that, I mean, you, you don't have access to, I mean, well, you have access to the particles in which you make two measurements, or you make measurements and you get outputs, okay? And these are the observed correlations between the two uh, systems. So now this is the, the causal network explanation, and this is the analog of what I'm plotting here, okay? Let's say this is something that we use in the, in the say, in the device independent scenario. We, were, we used to put these boxes, but I can equally represent this uh, device independent scenario in this causal network, okay? So there is this, state that is produced. I mean, I don't get any variable out of the source producing this state. I mean, I don't see any observed variables, but these particles propagate. And then you have an output that is produced given the input and the incoming particle, okay? And this is the causal network that is associated to this, say, physical step. Okay, you see the arrows tell you the causation. And basically, when I say that things happen here or are, are space-like separated, it means that there is no direct causation from X to B or from X to the source, okay? And this is just the network representing the causal constraints of a standard Bell theorem. And what is uh, then, the, how can you reinterpret a Bell's causality? Well, you can reinterpret Bell's causality telling you that uh, uh, there are uh, correlations that can be explained by a causal model when the objects in the causal model are quantum, but it cannot be explained by the same causal model when all the objects in the model are classical, okay? so. The causal model, the causal connections are the same, let's say, for the quantum Bell experiment and for the classical Bell experiment. Okay, so it's the same causal network. The only difference is that in one case, you assume that the hidden variable, uh, the, the particles prepared by the source, in one case are classical and the other case are quantum. Okay, so, but you see it's the same network. And then what Bell theorem tells you is that some causal models are valid for some observed correlations when they are quantum and some other causal models are not valid. Okay, so in a way, causality is affected by the presence of quantum information and you have to create a new theory of causality under the presence of quantum information. And I think this is something that uh, is worth studying. I mean, there are books even you know, on causality. And I think uh, and these books give you techniques to understand uh, causal inference among many other things. So I think uh, these books will need to include in the future an appendix about how causality, you have causality uh, in the presence of quantum information. Okay, and again, the disentanglement swapping experiment then is you can reinterpret it in this causal network, okay? So this is the entanglement swapping. Remember, there are two sources. You make this part, these measurements on the sources, on the particle prepared by the sources. Well, this is the causal network you see here, and I don't put any arrow from Y to A because I assume that these are well-defined, non-communicating processes. Okay, and 
this is the classical explanation. And if you replace here by quantum sources, you have the uh, qu quantum network associated to this uh, causal network. Okay, I hope everything is clear because this is, these are the techniques and that's how I'm going to use. So now let's go back to what our aims, okay? We want to characterize correlations, in particular quantum correlations in this scenario. And here we did, we got some results together with different people. So uh, there is in this first paper, there is Alejandro Potas, who was a PhD student in my group and, uh, and um, people, uh, and this is a collaboration with a group of uh, Daniel, sorry, of uh, Rafael Chavez in Brazil and, and uh, Miguel Navasquez. And this is a paper that we also got with Alejandro and Eli Wolfi. And it's again a collaboration with uh, Miguel Navasquez and his group. And we want to characterize again quantum correlations in networks. That is, we want to characterize sorry, this object or in general for a given network, we want to characterize this. Okay. Or if you remember what I, I just said about causality, we want to understand how you have to deal with. Uh, quantum networks when explaining uh, causal connections among uh, uh, observed, correlated observed variables. And this is challenging, okay? And this is challenging for the, actually it's challenging classically and also uh, and even more challenging in the quantum case, okay? And this is because the now the set of correlations is no longer complex, okay? So for instance, if you consider also a very uh, standard uh, network, which is a, what is called the triangle network. So this has been presented uh, Intensively studied by the group by the group in Geneva, Nicolas Brunet and Nicolas Gisan. So you have a, a network made of three particles who make measurements and they get correlated uh, particles from three independent sources. Okay, so here I hope it's clear. This is the, the um, causal network, but I, again, you can reinterpret this as a physical setup. And then each particle gets each device, each observer gets two particles and they may make entangled measurement on these two particles. Okay. And, you can see that the set of classical correlations where everything, so this is now classical instructions, is non-complex. And this makes uh, the characterization of these sets much more difficult. And if you now look at the, quantum the set of quantum correlations, we know it's larger, but it's again non-complex. Okay, well, my drawing abilities are always quite bad, okay, but this is supposed to be convex. And, okay, this, sorry, no, uh, this may not be convex. And indeed, I'm here taking a clearly non-convex part. Okay, and this makes the characterization much harder. And in these papers, we give techniques to solve uh, these issues. I mean, I would say that there is room for improvement because uh, scalability of this technique is not ideal. You can deal with rather small networks, but these techniques give you some hints about the limits on correlations you have in uh, uh, these quantum networks. And for that, we use something, I'm going to briefly tell you what we use here. So we use something that was introduced by uh, Wolfie, Speckens, and Fritz, which is the idea of inflation. Uh, okay, I don't know if there is a question. I saw someone raising their hand. I don't know if you should stop. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Hello, hello. Yeah. Uh, I go ahead. Okay, okay sorry. Okay, so can, no, can you give an I, I uh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Yes, I thought it was for me. Yes, please ask the question. Yes. Okay, so can you give an intuition or some some um, sense that how these correlations are non-convex? So unlike the uh, local, yes. um, yeah, unlike the Bell scenario. Yeah, so, so. Yeah, so if I go back to this bilocality, bilocality, sorry. So in the in the Bell scenario, okay, you see here, let's say there is only one uh, probability distribution, relevant probability distribution, which is the one you have here for the source, okay? And this may vary with some probability, but this is only the, you, I only have a sum over one given lambda, okay? And all these are just, functions and specifying the output given the input, but you can take these functions without losing generality of deterministic, okay? So basically this is the only element. So you only have one element that mixes different strategies. And this is why you have a convex set, okay? Because a probabilistic mixture of these uh, assignments here. And this defines right. a convex set. Right. Right. And when you go to the bilocality, if you had remained in the, what it was the EPR model, you would still have a convex object, but I think, the problem becomes much more interesting if you respect the causal constraints. And you see here, then there are two probability distributions. So things are no longer linear in the probability distribution. So, and then when you have nonlinear uh, mixtures, let's say, 
uh, then things become non-complex because well, you have this product of, of two uh, probability distributions. Okay, okay. Okay, so it's basically because you start having these independent preparations and then you start having all these um, these uh, products. Mixture of probability distribution. So that it is. Yeah, exactly. And for the quantum case, it's the same. Okay, so in the quantum case, before I only had a single set, so things are, you can see that they are convex. But now I have again these two independent preparations. I have this tensor product here that decon deconvexify. I'm not sure if this word exists, but uh, makes the problem non convex. Yeah. Yes. And in general, this will happen whenever you consider a situation with more than one source. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Good. So maybe uh, it's good that you interrupt me, but then maybe. I may miss some uh, uh, raised hands, okay? So I don't know how you, you be, uh, you are free to be brutal and interrupt me, okay? So don't, don't be shy. So I will quickly explain how you solve this issue, okay? And this is based on a very nice idea that was introduced by Wolf, Spekins and Fried in this paper. And basically what I did is like, okay, what something you can do with these networks is like, okay, I want to see if some given correlations are compatible with this network. I don't know, this is the problem of causal inference. I want to understand if these causes can explain these correlations. And then what these people did is like, okay, sorry, here there is a bit of change because I took the figures from, from uh, another presentation, but these are now the hidden variables, okay? This is the triangle network, okay? Just a bit of, and these are the observed variables. So now instead of using squares and, and circles, I use circles, but I change the color between hidden and observed variables. And what these people did is like, okay, if something has an explanation in this network, I can construct a more complicated network in which I take copies of these sources. Okay, so you see here, lambda one AC and lambda two AC are copies of these sources. And I send these classical instructions to some other observers. Okay, this seems like you are complicated the problem, but clearly, if this network can give rise to these probabilities, then this, say, inflated network in which I only I use the same objects will give rise to an, another probability. I don't know much about this other probability, but I know about some marginals of this probability. Because for instance, if you look at the probability between B11 and C11, this is the probability in which they do the same as in this network and get sources from lambda one. So this marginal has to be the same as this marginal here, okay? And the same for B11 and C21, okay? Because again, it's the same instructions that are duplicated here that you can do because it's classical information and they do the same, okay? So this marginal is equal to this marginal and is equal to this marginal. So then you wonder whether there exists a probability distribution satisfying all these marginal constraints. And this is a marginal problem you can solve with linear programming. And sometimes you can see that this problem has no solution and he, then this problem cannot have solution and then this model cannot explain these correlations. I hope it's more or less clear what I mean, but this is the key concept in all these constructions. So the problem with this construction we, is that it works for the classical case, but you see here, you're making information broadcasting and this is impossible if these sources are quantum. So we had to adapt inflation to, to the quantum case. I don't have time to tell you how we did that, but we did, did that, I mean, you only have to do a different type of inflation, and then you can have a method to uh, understand when some correlations are compatible with a given quantum causal model. Okay, so we have some techniques to, to understand uh, correlations in, in quantum networks. Now let's make use of the tools we developed during these years, and let's, I, I, will, I will tell you about two results, one um, for foundations and another one for quantum information theory. So just question, how, how uh, long is it supposed, uh, is my talk supposed to be? Yeah, 45 minutes, uh, okay, then good. time for questions. Questions, okay, good. So uh, the first result I want to tell you about is this uh, paper that was published uh, two years ago with, again, it was collaboration, it was my colleague I know who was at the time postdoc in my group and it was collaboration with, uh, uh, the group in, in Geneva, Nicola Brunner, and the group in, in uh, Nicola Gisal, sorry, and especially the group in Vienna of Miguel Navasquez. Okay. So here it's a result on quantum foundations. We wanted to understand if uh, in quantum theory you really need to use complex numbers in standard quantum theory. Okay. So 
This is because if you think about uh, quantum theory in the standard Hilbert space formulation, it's the first time that we encounter a theory whose axioms are phrased in terms of complex numbers. Okay, so these are the axioms of standard Hilbert space quantum theory. Okay, you, and they, they tell you that, uh, okay, even the first postulate, no, it tells you uh, that to any physical system, you associate a Hilbert space of a complex Hilbert space. Okay, and then you say, once you have this, you associate this Hilbert space to a system, then you say that the state of the system is a vector, and then you know that the measurement is defined by a basis or a orthogonal projectors, and then you compute probabilities according to the Born rule, and then you compose systems according to the tensor product. Okay, so these are just postulates that we assume, okay, we take for granted. But it's a bit weird that really you have to deal with complex Hilbert space. I mean, if you think about other theories before quantum theory, none, uh, what, no theory was formulated in terms of complex numbers, okay? So in, in electromagnetics, we sometimes use complex numbers to simplify calculations, but we always take the real part. And indeed, I mean, the, the uh, Maxwell equations are for real quantities, the electric and uh, electromagnetic fields, okay? So it, uh, quantum physics was really a change in, in the, I mean, it was a change in many different things, but in particular it was a change also because you had postulates phrased in terms of complex numbers. And this was a, a question that, uh, somewhat was relevant even for the founder of the theory okay so it's nice to see here the the this uh, quote from uh, a letter of schrodinger to lorenz in which he writes this and he wonders whether psi is really i mean he was convinced that psi was uh, fundamentally a real function okay and this is the question we want to understand so we want to understand what happens if you replace complex numbers by real numbers in quantum theory so what i'm saying is that you take the same theory defined by the same postulates but you, I mean, you take the same postulates, but you simply change complex by real. Okay, so this is really change I'm going to implement in my theory. And okay, this is a question that has a, a, a sort of long tradition in the uh, quantum foundations community. So you can give a look at this paper, for instance, where they, they, they talk about this question. So you can also, again, understand this as a sort of challenge between two players. And the, the logic is a bit similar to, to Bell theorem. Okay, so you may see as someone who believes that complex numbers are not really fundamental in quantum theory and believes that a, a real quantum theory is able to explain any possible experiment okay in, in the Bell theory this is a uh, a person who believes in uh, local hidden variable models and on the other uh, side you have someone who believes in quantum physics and wants to prove this uh, other person with an alternative model to be wrong okay and the way you prove that this uh, competitor is wrong is by designing an experiment that this competitor cannot explain with uh, the alternative model okay in bell theorem was uh, local in the variable model i mean there is no local in the variable model that can explain uh, bell, uh, bell test here we want to find some sort of bell test for real uh, hilbert space uh, quantum theory so we want to find an experiment that no one can explain through with real hilbert spaces real matrices and, and projectors and tensor products Okay, and this is important to keep in mind that I will be using tensor products. So uh, let's uh, think about how we can do that. So we have, a, a, say, a complex uh, quantum physicist, some, someone who believes in quantum uh, quantum physics, and a real quantum physicist. So let's me consider. Let's start by the simplest scenario we can think of. So there is the, the complex quantum physics thinks of a scenario in which you make some measurements on some uh, particles. Okay, and I'm. You may have different states being prepared and different measurements, but I'm going to do it for the simplest case of a, a measurement acting on a state. I mean, this can be generalized to different preparations and different measurements. Okay, so the probability is then described by the Born rule where all these are complex operators. Okay, this is a description by the complex uh, quantum physicist. And now the complex quantum physicist wants to find uh, an experiment, so some statistics generating an experiment that the real quantum theories cannot explain. Well, this can be proven to be impossible, okay? Because if you give me this probability, I, and this is how you falsify things, okay? You observe some statistics and you challenge the other person to uh, reproduce the statistic with uh, the model that uh, this person has in mind, okay? So this is what happened in Bell's theorem, okay? So you had uh, some statistics and then the local hidden variable uh, model experiment uh, theories cannot explain uh, these statistics. So we're going to do the same. But in this case, the real quantum theories can always uh, uh, succeed, okay? So you have the state, what, what this person is going to do, uh, and it, it's very simple to understand, it's like somehow he, uh, the person is going to understand 
that uh, a complex number is just two real numbers. So this uh, real quantum physics, he will double the Hilbert space. So now he will be dealing with a real Hilbert space of dimension twice the dimension of the complex uh, Hilbert space used by the complex quantum physicists. So uh, he adds this he adds this extra qubit and he's going to use these two states for the extra qubit. Okay, these are the eigenstate of sigma y, you see? They are complex, so, but don't get confused. I mean, I'm going in the end, I'm going to use this, but I'm going to use it to get real. Everything is going to be real, okay? But I'm going to use these two states for this extra qubit. So what this real quantum physics does, uh, uh, he takes the state prepared by the complex quantum physicists, rho, and he constructs this new state in this larger Hilbert space, which is rho tensor product i plus i plus rho complex conjugate minus i. Okay, and you can see that this state is real, okay, because if you take the complex conjugation here, rho goes into rho complex conjugate and i goes into minus i, okay, and rho goes into rho complex conjugate goes into rho and i goes into minus y. So the two terms exchange. And this rho tilde complex conjugate is equal to rho tilde. So this is real. And you apply the same trick. I mean, you can see that this is a state, it's positive and it's normalized. And you apply the same trick to the measurement. Okay, so you take the uh, complex matrix you had here, you put it with i, and you put the complex conjugate, you put it with minus i. Again, you can see that this is real. And now, if you compute the probabilities according to the bond rule with these two real operators, you can see that you get the same probabilities. Okay, so there is no way you can falsify real quantum theory with any experiment in this uh, uh, geometry, because I can always find this, this explanation. Okay, maybe we were a bit too uh, simplistic in our approach, you may think. So the, quantum, the complex quantum physicists now, she thinks about our new experiment and says, okay, I mean, in the, in the, when testing local hidden variable models, something that was very useful is to go into a Bell scenario where you have different observers making measurements on an entangled state so we're going to do the same here and again i'm going to prove it for two parties but this extends to any number of parties okay whenever you prepare an entangled state that goes to different parties so you have this state and you have these local measurements and now the way the real quantum physics is going to reproduce these statistics is given by adding a qubit for any entangled particle okay so now if you want for two particles you are going to multiply the dimension by four and then you play the same trick, okay? So you do this for the state, you see, but now there's an extra qubit and you put an i for each particle or a minus i for each particle. Again, you can see that this state is real because if you take complex conjugate, these two things exchange, but it's symmetric. So you have the same state. And now for each party, you put the same trick, but for the qubit received by, uh, so each local system is duplicated and the global system is has a dimension which is multiplied by two um, to the power to the number of particles. Okay, so but I hope you understand that this is a valid state, this is a valid measurement. And now if you compute the probabilities with these real operators and these real measurements, you get the same numbers. Okay, so again, uh, there is no way you can falsify a real quantum theory in, in any Bell uh, scenario. Okay, and you can interpret this as somehow i and minus i is a flag telling the parties whether to implement whether the state received is raw or raw complex conjugate and the measurement has to be either pi or pi complex conjugate okay this is a way of interpreting but again you can forget about this and you can simply see as a real explanation for your experiment and if you have a real explanation if you have an explanation within your theory the theory cannot be falsified and this construction for example was given in this paper by McKay, Moskow, and Gisam. So after this paper, in a way, it was thought that there was no way of falsifying real quantum theory. In a way, you may think that Schrodinger was right. And after all, the adoption of complex numbers is just a matter of simplicity because things become perhaps simpler here than here, but there is no fundamental reason for that. Okay, so what we thought is like, okay, we know now that we have other variants, we have more complex networks, so let's use them for this question. And this is what we did, okay? So basically we went into this bilocality entanglement swapping experiment and we consider an experiment in which there are two independent states that are being prepared and three measurements. And then we identify some uh, uh, complex preparation in this experiment. You see with all these tensor products that are enforced by the network geometry. And then uh, we prove that uh, these statistics cannot be reproduced by the same quantum model in which you replace everything by real operators, no matter which dimension of this object, okay? So there is no ex real, there is no explanation in real quantum theory for some statistics that you generate in this experiment, okay? And this opened the way to a falsification of, uh, of real quantum theory. 
And we knew that our experiment was, uh, our proposal was feasible. Well, I, this is also one of the reasons why we got published in this uh, uh, very selective journal because it was feasible. And in fact, uh, a few months after our proposal uh, was um, public, there were two independent experiments, one in the group of Pan, the other one in the group of Fan in, in China to cook with us that uh, falsify real quantum theory. Okay, so this is now say a close, um, this has been demonstrated in the labs. And the last result I want to tell you about is, is a more recent result. It's about self-testing and it was published in Nature Physics. So what is self-testing? Self-testing is a very interesting property you have in quantum physics, which is uh, in the device independent scenario, uh, you know that you can say a lot about uh, the state and measurements implemented by our parties when you are uh, getting a maximal violation of a Bell inequality. So the points giving you the maximal violation of inequality are quite unique. And there are very few ways of uh, reproducing the statistics given a maximal violation of Bell inequality in quantum theory. I think there was a question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so, so sorry to interrupt. <coughs> so Good, yes, actually, no my question is for your falsifying uh, real quantum mechanics. Yeah. Yes. So are you saying that uh, when we have like single particle correlation or say your bell type correlation, we are not evidencing yes. this this one like a real theory real quantum theory is falsified so so yes. network network non local co correlations are tilted mm -hmm. the only correlation by seeing which i can falsify right so in yes. other domains it is not there this proof is not there like for, yes. for, so for saying, single particle yes. single particle correlation or bell type correlation yes but is it an open yes. open question like so, uh, whether it can be done. I, I would say that before, so I would say, okay, I don't know, this is my feeling. I don't know what people thought, okay? So I think people knew this, I mean, long time ago that you could always play this trick, okay? But somehow here, uh, if you consider, okay, this is clear. And uh, and I think, uh, I don't know, maybe it was now by in the 60s or 50s, I don't know when, but it, this is a very well-established result. But people, you see here, I mean, this qubit that tells you whether to have raw and raw compass conjugate, when you have a bell experiment in which you have many particles, people didn't know how to share this qubit, no? Because in principle, cannot be clear. But actually, all what you know about this extra qubit is that classical correlations, okay? Because you only, some of you only tell to the parties whether the state is raw and raw compass conjugate, okay? And this is what happens here in this explanation, okay? You simply clone this qubit because actually it's not a, it's even classical yeah. information, okay? But you put it in this i and minus y so that you can get real operators at the very end, okay? And uh, because here, if you put zero and one, you don't get a real operator, okay? You only get a real operator because you put i and minus one i, okay? But it's, this is enough for your purposes. And well, this is what you do here. So somehow it was thought at that time that it was impossible to classify real quantum theory. And it was only with all this network business came that we understood that okay, if you would really want to follow the, the topology of the network, you also have to put tensor pr products in the state, not only in the measurements, okay? And this gives a richer structure, and this was, uh, uh, we could use this to exploit, re to falsify real quantum theory. Yeah, so somehow the moral is that if you don't put any tensor product, you can do it with real quantum theory. If you put a tensor product in the measurements, you can still do it with real quantum theory. In fact, I didn't tell you about, but if you put only a tensor product in the states, you can also do it with real quantum theory. But if you put tensor products in the measurements and in the preparations, then you cannot do it with real quantum theory. This is another way of understanding the results. So, the, so, so, so that means uh, uh, that means uh, this network quantum uh, non-local correlations that has a extra component in the correlation part that cannot be explained by any real quantum theory, okay? Yes, you can put it like this. Of course, they can yeah. be explained if you forget about this tensor network, okay? Because if you say, no, no, I believe that my explanation has to be with a single state, then you are back to the bad scenario, okay? So I think it's crucial that you also enforce the real quantum theories to explain the correlations under the same assumptions, okay? Under the same tensor product structure. All right, right. This is the trick. All right, Th thank you. Okay. So I was telling you the micro results in some self-testing, this is more a quantum information application. And basically this was a concept introduced by Bayas and Yao in this paper and what I saw, oh, okay, there is one more question.
Are you? Do I have a new question? I'm not sure. No? I don't see your reaction, sorry. Okay, I proceed. Okay. okay, so basically you have the source and this source, you, you have say some black boxes making an experiment and let's assume this experiment generates a uh, maximal quantum relation CHSH. Then you can prove that you can certify that the state produced by the source is basically a maximum entangled state of two qubits and the measurements are the ones we know that produces the maximal violation of CHSH. Okay, actually Myers and Yao didn't prove the result by for CHSH. Actually, this result was proven before by Tillerson that the only way of getting this violation is by making these measurements on a maximum entangled state. But Myers and Yao introduced the concept of cell testing and they did self testing of the maximum entangled state through another uh, Bell inequality. Okay, so basically, Self-testing means that, is that you design a, a bell type experiment that certifies that the state produced by the source is the given target state, and then you self-test that given state. So CHSH equal to two short of two, self-test the presence of the maximum entangled state of two qubits in the source without making any assumption about anything. Okay, so you're not saying that these are two qubit state, but it follows somehow from the uh, bell violation. Now you have to understand also that this certification is up to some uh, freedom, okay? Because clearly the state can also be any other two qubit maximum entangled state. It can be psi plus, psi minus, phi. I mean, it can be any state, okay? Because uh, of course, in, if instead of this state, you apply some local unitaries here and you apply the same local unitary to the measurements, when you compute the probabilities, you get the same probabilities, okay? So I'm saying that this is the state up to local unitaries, but basically any maximum entangled state of two qubits is the same up to local unitaries. Okay, so basically you are you can certify that it is a, a maximal maximum entangled state of two qubits through the uh, CHSH value of equal to two square root of two. Okay, so this is self testing. Okay, so you make an experiment, you generate some statistics, and you can then say what is inside the boxes from the statistics. Okay. Sometimes people, and I also like, sort of like it, they call it it's a sort of device independent tomography, okay? From the statistics, you certify the prepared state and sometimes even the implemented measurements. And we can argue that it's the strongest form of quantum certification, okay? Because you don't make any assumption about the devices, but you even specify the state of, of the devices. Okay, and this is what I say, okay? So your certification is somewhat complete up to, for instance, local interoperations and also complex conjugation. Okay. This is not super relevant in the in the bipartite case because pure you can pure states are um, you can there is a basis in which a state is equal to its complex conjugate, which is the Schmidt basis, but this becomes relevant for more parties. So what is the definition of cell testing? Okay, there are several definitions, but I think now that it's usually accepted is that okay, you have some correlations and now you want to see all possible ways of getting these correlations okay and now you want to see that if you have any way of getting these correlations you can always construct uh, some channels tau one and tau n local channels that when applied to the state that gave rise to the correlations extract the given target state okay so in self testing you say that a state psi n can be self tested if you can design some correlations such that for any way of writing these correlations, you can extract the target state from the uh, state used to obtain the correlations through some local channels. Okay, so saying that the, in my device there is a maximally that gives CHSH equal to two root of two, there is a maximum entangled state. What I'm saying is that in this device there is a maximum entangled state to give it state there, and I could extract it. Okay, if I had a, if I had access to these channels, but because of these freedoms you know that all what you can extract is something like this okay so you can have the state up to uh, uh complex conjugation okay and also local unitaries okay but these local unitaries are observing the definition of a quantum maps and this freedom with complex conjugation is given by this extra freedom so this is uh, the definition of the testing adopted then we know that all particular state can be set tested all poor pure bad states, all graph states. So these are different results obtained by different uh, sets of people, some multipartite entangled states. So what we did is, okay, let's use networks to uh, self-test uh, states. So we first introduced a concept of network assisted self-testing. So you have some probabilities and you assume that these are given by some states and measurements on these states. 
and again, if you can define some channels that extract this, the target state, you can say that this is uh, self-tested. Sorry, there was a mistake here because uh, this and no, sorry, sorry, no, it's okay. So know that here the indices are different. Okay, so it can be that your experiment consists of n parties, but you apply the channels to a subset of them. Okay, so if you want to interpret this, you have some devices, you make, you generate some statistics, and then you can certify that in a potentially a subset of these devices, you have the state you want to certify. Okay, you see here m is equal to five and n is equal to three. And what I'm saying is that you want to prove that if you generate some statistics in this belt test, you can extract the given target state in the, in the, in the, from the network. Okay, this is the first idea we introduced. But now if you follow all my talk, you may say, okay, maybe this is not the smartest way you can use the network. And actually you should also impose constraints on the states prepared by the network because following from the network topology. And this is what we call fully network system self-testing. Okay, so you have, you also introduce some more tensor products on the states. Okay, and this is, and in this case, uh, the, the certification, you, you can even break this liberty between a uh, uh, combination of psi and the complex conjugate. So you can even certify that the state is either the target state or its complex conjugate. Okay, and this is impossible in a standard belt scenario and it follows simply because of this network and it's very related to this real uh, discussion we were discussing, we were uh, talking about before. Okay, I don't have time to tell you, but okay, this, if you look at the paper, you will see this better explained, okay? Okay, how we do that, we, I don't have time to, I'm afraid I don't have time to tell you, maybe if you're interested, I can tell you about this in the questions because I'm, I'm running short of time, but we use something called, uh, as a sort of a variant of CHSH in which you combine three CHSH inequalities. This is an object that is very interesting for all these self-testing applications and we have, we have used it in different scenarios and also some other people have used this CHSH3 that you can see here. Actually, we also used this CHSH3 in the proof of real quantum theory. But I don't have time to explain you, I'm sorry. So basically what we did, we uh, used networks to self-test any state, okay? So uh, we gave a net, you have to set so test a state of say seven parties, you give it a state, I construct this network. So the size of this inner circle is equal to the state you want to set test. And you add some extra singlets here. And for these extra singlets, you look at the maximal violation of this CHSH type inequality. And you can prove, I don't have time, that if you can generate some statistics in this network that set test the presence of your target state in the middle of the network. Okay, so details can be found in the paper. So somehow we solve the problem of cell testing when exploiting network geometries. And in the case of fully network assisted cell testing, where you also impose that these things ha have a tensor product, then the network gets even simplified because all these output parties, if you impose the, the network geometry in your experiment, you can put them together. Okay, so you can understand that all these parties come together here in the upper part. Okay, and you put all of them together, you have this network, oh, well, or in the lower part, sorry. So you put all this, the lower part into a single party. Then you are, you have this, okay? You have this, this is the inner circle that now becomes a line. And these are all the ending nodes that just become a single node, they are all put together. And here, if you use the network geometry, you can, do the same machinery, have also self-testing. Okay, so this is the one in which I, I don't impose the network constraint and here the one where I impose the network constraints and in all these two constructions, self-test any uh, multipartite entangled state. And okay, it's a bit, I go now for your question. So it's a bit uh, uh, more complicated, but say the complexity, okay, it's mostly a theoretical result, but I would say the complexity is not super crazy because all what you need is to add some extra singlets Okay, people can know how to prepare extra singlets. And you have to perform here the measurements or projective measurements when we know how to do that in the first case of qubits. Okay, there was a question. Uh, uh, hello, uh, can you hear me? Yeah, sure. Okay, uh, so uh, I think I think I've come across this paper before, so I had one doubt. Uh, uh, so does the number of uh, entanglement, uh, the number of entangled states used in this procedure 
depend on the dimension or the number of uh, subsystems in the main state. Sure, yes. So if you have to set this a state of five qubits, you need five extra singlets. Yeah, this is the, what you're saying, okay? So you see here the state you want to set test will be extracted from this part of the network. And you have to include an, a number of singlets that is the same as the size of the number of particles in this, your target state. Yes. In both scenarios. Uh, okay. uh, also, like, what about the dimension of uh, one subsystem? So let's say we have a five partite system and uh, each subsystem is uh, instead of a qubit, uh, we have a qubit of some higher dimension. Uh, can this still be done? I think so. I mean, things are a bit more complicated, but yes. I mean, we didn't, uh, if I remember, well, we didn't do it uh, with all details in the paper, okay? So there might be some issues, but I think it's, it can be done. I mean, something that is missing here, uh, I mean, it can also be proven, uh, I believe, but we didn't do it. You can also find that this scheme is robust, I believe. But probably using some standard tricks that are used in, in, in set testing, probably the robustness you will get is very small. Uh, I think an open question is how to do these tests uh, robust. But yes, I don't, I don't think dimension really matters, although our paper is focuses uh, mostly on qubits. Okay, thank you. Okay, so with this, I come to the conclusions. Okay, so. Uh, I was telling you many things, but I hope I mean, it was more for you to have a, an overview about some of the results in my group and some of, some of the motivation in this network stuff. So I think one of the motivations is theoretical, so we want to understand what you can do with quantum networks, but I think also there is, uh, it's the problem is also timely because these networks are being prepared, okay? So when we falsify real quantum theory, we know that the experiment was going to come soon because people can do these small quantum networks now in the lab. So it makes sense to understand what you can do this quantum networks beyond the standard uh, Bell scenario of Alice and Bob. And we know that these networks allow you to do things that are impossible in the standard uh, Bell scenario. So we can uh, falsify real quantum theory. Uh, at the moment, we have a method to set test uh, any state using the, the network. Okay? So we don't know how to do it if we don't use the network. So not a question, it's like, okay, what else? So I don't know, it's, uh, I think it's an, an interesting uh, problem for you to consider. And I think what I say also, I think this is something that deserves to be considered. It's like, okay, how do we have to rethink about causality and understanding causality when you have quantum phenomena? And I think this is relevant beyond quantum information theory. I think causality is understood in many disciplines. People study causality in biology, in medicine, okay? And if one day these disciplines are affected by quantum phenomena, then you will also have to adapt your techniques to understand causality to quantum phenomena. And with this, I conclude my talk. Thank you. Thanks a lot for your attention. Yeah. So yeah. Thank you uh, so much uh, for for the very nice talk, Professor. So we will we will take a couple of uh, short questions um, from the audience. Uh, yeah. Samgit, do you have questions? Yes. 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 Yeah. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So. Uh, I, I, from what I could understand, uh, you mentioned that uh, these uh, networks uh, uh, don't really have like this convex structure, like the network correlations does not have the convex structure, right? Uh, when it yes. comes to the quantum correlations. So, uh, or, what, or even what, classical correlations. Uh, convex either. So, uh, so, so what about like these uh, beyond quantum correlations or uh, you know, the set of all non, no, no signaling correlations in that way. Like, oh. Yes, uh, I'm not a super expert on these things. Uh, like, I, I think they are, they are not convex. They are not. They are. They are not convex either. So all these objects are not convex. Okay. okay. Thanks. Any more questions? Uh, yes. Devasis, I have a small question. Yes, yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, yeah. Professor Asin, a wonderful talk. I was just wondering if somebody has used this Grangier causality in analyzing the questions of causality. This causality, my last uh, point in the conclusion, you mean? Grangier causality, you know, this time series, we try to see which time series is influencing which one through something called Grangier causality, which is used in economics 
and other areas. Okay, I'm not familiar with. See, uh, you see, I mean, to me, I'm going to be a bit naive with my statement. So I, I don't know anything about this type of causality. Okay, but to me, it's a relevant question to understand. You open a book on causality, okay, okay. and you see something, and to wonder, okay, what would happen to this uh, phenomenon if I changed everything by quantum? Okay. I think this is uh, something like, uh, like for instance, yeah, I mean, you, can, you can maybe even say quantitative things like. We have yeah. a, a situation in which we consider uh, in the past a prepare and measure scenario in which Alice prepares stuff and Bob makes measurement. So this is also a causal network in which there is something prepared here that goes to a second party that makes measurements. So here we know, for instance, that, that you can explain everything classically, okay? So because you can have everything, everything, everything classically, but so there is no quantum classical separation, but there is a quantum classical separation if uh, you bound the, the alphabet that goes from Alice to Bob, okay? So the dimension of these particles. So I think it's, again, I think it's interesting to understand many of these, against time series, you can see as a particle yes. evolving and you observe this particle and this generates right. a time series, okay? So to understand how these things can be, ha, can be explained within quantum physics or within classical physics and whether you can have gaps in this. And, but I like these questions, yes. Okay. But I don't okay. know how to do it for the particular okay. case you were mentioning. Yeah, okay, thanks, yeah. So Antonio, it's Dipankar here, Dipankar. Ho. So hello, thanks yes. for the nice lucid talk. Uh, thanks for the nice lucid talk. Now, one question about that complex uh, quantum mechanics part, your nice work. That So really the upshot is that real quantum theory is falsified if one tries to explain the correlations imposing the tensor product structure. So the imposing yes. the tensor product structure distinguishes between two sets of real quantum theory. One can then say, is this right way of putting uh, that one which yes. imposes an knowledge that what is experimentally ruled out is one that imposes tensor product structure. Yes. So what is the yes. a priori justification from the real point of view? Suppose a physicist who tries to explain by real quantum theory, not biased by standard quantum theory formulations. Mm -hmm. What will be the a priori or prima facie justification for any? any yeah, I don't think, uh, yes. So I think uh, if you think about falsifying uh, a real theory, okay, I think a real theory can never be falsified in the sense that uh, we falsify things through statistics, and statistics is given by real numbers. Okay. okay, so you can okay. always make an ad hoc model for your theory, which is even the, the genetic statistics. Okay, so uh -huh. you can be very brutal in your theory. Okay, so in this sense, so this only becomes possible when you have a model. Okay, and then, of course, we also know that there are real explanations for complex quantum theory. For instance, bomb theory uh -huh. has the same predictive power as uh, quantum theory. Okay, uh -huh. and it's a real theory, but it's a theory that somehow has nothing to do with our standard quantum theory phrase mm -hmm. in terms of Hilbert spaces. Mm -hmm. And a uh, uh, real Hilbert space theory in which there is no tensor product, so everything mm -hmm. is a, a single Hilbert space, mm -hmm. is also not falsifiable, okay? Okay. So this is true, okay? So what we did was, okay, let's take complex Hilbert space theory with the postulates, and let's make the minimal change to this theory, which is wherever it's written complex, we write real, but we keep all the postulates. Okay. including the one on tensor product. And we prove that this minimal change can be falsified. But I agree with you, there are other variants in which you are a bit more brutal in your change or in your yeah, definition yes. of real quantum so, theory. So like your argument theory. is uh, is applying some sort of Occam's reserve, I mean, minimalistic change. Yeah. You could put it like this, yes. I mean, mm -hmm. we knew that if you go very far in your changes, then you have a real theory. Yeah, okay, okay. With okay. The same so, predictive so, power so, that's, as yeah, so that was theory. the motivation. Yes, this, that was our motivation. Yes. But yeah, okay, I understand. That was not clear by reading your paper, so I wanted to know. But it's a beautiful okay, piece Sorry, of work. Yes. It's a beautiful piece of work and very, very okay. stimulating. The other is, I'm just curious if there are two minutes you can tell about CHSH three. You did not spend. Even, okay. Is it possible to tell? Can I? I don't know what what, what does the okay, chairman can I say? Tell you quickly because I could not catch the essence of CHS three. By I okay, want so to get the physical lessons. Okay. okay. Can I or I don't know? 
What yes, the yes, say? yes, yes, yes. Okay. The chairman, can are you, you the chairman or? No, no, I'm not the chairman. Okay, yes. Devashish. Okay. Yeah, please, Devashish. please. Yeah, please. Yeah, please. Yeah. Yes, the okay, chairman so... has permitted. Okay. It's just okay, few, good. Few. Uh, I think people are hungry yeah, okay. for the lunch, but anyway, I guess yes. in okay, India. Okay. okay. So, yes. so uh, just few. I can briefly tell you some of the main idea. Okay. So again, in such why this object is interesting for the point of view of cell testing, also device independent scenario, but especially for cell testing. So again, if you interpret cell testing as a sort of, you want to achieve some sort of device dependent tomography. And the way you do tomography is you have a state for qubits, you have a state and you make measurements in the X, Y, and Z basis. This is tomography. Now let's try to do something similar for the device dependent scenario, okay? So what you have, you have this uh, ex experiment in which you prepare a maximum entanglement set of qu two qubits and you take this CHSH, which is a CHSH between, you have three settings on Alice and six settings on Bob. Mm. And you can start the CHSH for settings one, two on Alice and one, two on Bob. Mm. The CHSH for settings one, two on Alice and three, four on Bob. And CHSH for settings two, three on Alice and five, six on Bob. Okay, so this means that this is A1B1 plus A1B2 plus A2B1 mm -hmm. minus A2B2. And this is A2B5 uh, plus A2B6 plus A3B5 minus A3B6. Okay, so you take CHSH, but you, you put this in the settings here. Now, what is the maximal violation of this inequality? Well, it's at most can be three times the maximal violation of each component, which is three times two square root of two. Hmm. Now, let's see if we can achieve this, okay? So if we want to achieve two square root of two, I have to prepare a maximal Lattanker state. Okay, so okay. this is the only way this comes from Cielson. Okay, so the, the state has to be maximum in state. Now, if I want to maximally violate this, I have to take, where did I have it? Okay, yes, okay, this set is. Okay. Uh -huh. Okay, so I will do that, okay? Mm -hmm. So I take these settings mm -hmm. and one and two will be the ones giving me the, the corresponding violation. Okay, mm -hmm. so it's, this is not so important. Okay, but now I want to violate this. Okay, so the state is the right one. Uh -huh. One is is Z, and three I can take it X or any one here. Okay, it doesn't matter. What matters is that it's in the in this equator. Okay, okay. But it can, it could even be again, A three could be still equal to A two. Okay, uh -huh. I can still maximally violate these two. But now I also want to find the maximum relation of CHSH with two and three, okay? So this tells me that this angle has to be also 90 degrees. Okay. Oh. So what you get with this, if you want to maximally evaluate these three at the same time, you have to prepare this state and the settings on Alice's side, they have to be say X, Y, and Z up mm -hmm. to local unitaries. Mm -hmm. But what happens if you measure X, Y, and Z on a maximal entangled state? You prepare X, Y, and Z on the other party. Okay. So it's like you are preparing a tomographically complete set of states by making this process, by having this maximal violation. Oh, 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 that's and this is what I do here. So this thing somehow allows me to apply some sort of tomography for these objects here. And this mm -hmm. is why I can set test the state that I put in this particle. So, well, this is, I'm trying to explain you the idea very quickly. Huh? I'm yeah, sure no, I know, but, but still I get the sense. So that is the idea that you, yeah, so we the try with this CHSH, state. we certify the presence of some tomographically complete uh, states, states. Okay. Yeah. And then we use this to use results from tomography to make, we upgrade yeah. tomography to device dependent tomography that is through self testing. Okay, okay, okay. It's a, it's a powerful idea. And this is the minimum. Yeah, I think we have, of we have used this trick. We yeah. use this trick even for the complex VL. Uh, we also use this yes, CHSH3. Yeah. It's very useful. Yes, okay. Thank you. Thank you, Anton. Yeah, Hello. so Samgit, if you have like only short yeah. question. Yeah, I have a couple of questions, very short. Like, uh, yeah. so yeah. first of all, like uh, you mentioned something about this, uh, uh, like, yeah, so self-testing basically works, like uh, you use it uh, to uh, see if the states maximally violate the inequalities, right? So if I see, I want to understand, if I see the maximal violation of better inequality, what are the possible states that can give me this maximal violation? Yes, yes. Uh, so uh, suppose, uh, can, can we use like other, the, uh, I've heard that uh, there are other types of inequalities, inequalities like uh, uh, Hardy non-locality and such. 
So can we use those to self-test states that maximally violate the, those inequalities? Sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, uh, the, all the idea of self-testing is like, tell me the state you want to self-test, and I have to find the bell state that self-tests this state, and this, the bell, the bell inequality, sorry, whose maximal violation self-tests this state. Yeah, this is some of the idea. So, for instance, for the for some partially entangled states, you don't use CHSA because it doesn't work for partially entangled states. But there, are, there is something called a tilted uh, bell inequality, and if you use this other bell inequality, you can self test any partially entangled state of two qubits. Oh. Yeah, so you have to shape your bell test to the state you want to self test. Okay, so we can customize our self-test to uh, self-test. You have to, you have to, you okay. have to, yes, you have to. Okay, so, okay, thank you, thank you. Okay, yeah, so uh, let us thank Professor Yassin one, once more for the wonderful talk. And we thank all the speakers in the, in the morning sessions, all the three speakers. And with that, let me uh, hand it over to Professor Anikdai, sir. Yeah, thank you, Devasis, and thank you all the speakers. So I think okay. we can go for launch right now. Okay, bye. Uh, thank you. Huh? Yeah. It was nice to see you online. Yeah. Hope to see <laughs> you soon in person. Uh, thank you, Antonio, and hope to see you in India again. Yes. <laughs> yes. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Oh, bye, -bye. bye. Thank, thank you, you all the participants for your kind attention. We have our lunch break now. And from 3 p.m., we have uh, another session from 3 to 5. Uh, with Professor, uh, sorry, Dr. Love you then Santo and then Harsavardhan Wanare. So thank you all. Thank you. Yeah.